Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for um, your patience. And I welcome you tonight to the um, board meeting of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees for Wednesday, November 16th, 2022. We're glad you're here. Um, we're going to start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. And will um, Trustee Orozco lead us in the pledge tonight? States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If there is an agenda, agendized item tonight that you'd like to speak on, um, you need to get a yellow speaker card in the back of the room put your name there and what item you'd like to speak on and provide the card to Ava sitting at the end. And Ava will send it down and we'll call your name. Uh, if you need Spanish translation tonight, we do have Yorania Lopez. She's our translator. She's over here at this side of the room and she'll be happy to set you up with a translation kit. Ava, can you say that in Spanish? Um, solo queríamos informarles si ocupan traducción, la señora López le puede ayudar con un aparato para ese servicio. Uh, next up, we'll have our superintendent's comments. This is from Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, well, thank you so much. So today we had a really wonderful event. So if everyone thinks I went to the prom, I didn't go to the prom, um, but I did receive a corsage because we had our um, ribbon cutting of our Emerald Lagasse um, teaching kitchen. So it was quite the feat. Um, so we, it literally took us um, three years to do it. Um, we received a, a large donation from the Emerald Lagasse Foundation and then our community put forth um, almost $1.5 million um, of the funding in order to make it possible. And so today, um, I'd say about 150 people, 150 people were present um, from the entire community to really spotlight the event and they were able to go in and see children in action. So if you haven't been able to see the wonderful facility and the wonderful garden um, that is at Starlight Elementary, I encourage you to go there. Um, and then on Tuesday, um, as you know, I have um, superintendent advisory and I had so many students that wanted um, to be part of it that I wasn't able to have all students do it. So one by one, I'm going to the different high schools to be able to talk to the students that couldn't participate in the actual um, superintendent advisory. And I just thought, I asked them, I'm with them for almost an hour, but one thing I asked them, if, if, if adults could know one thing, what, what, would, what should we know? And I just want to share a few of them because I think that it's just important for us to, um, to know. So their first thing was, is um, our parents put responsibilities on us and that becomes our first priority. So please know that. Um, also that um, they need safe spaces like the college and career centers. So when I was in there, that's where we had the lunch. Um, there were about 30 or 40 other students that were in there for lunchtime and that was really their safe space. And so they just said um, how important that space was for them. Um, they also mentioned the library was another place. Um, and then the second is that they, they too have a social life and that um, deadline should be flexible for them. So um, I just want to, to just note um, um, some of the things, but I thought the most important one is there, and almost all, all the 10 that I spoke with mentioned it, is that their parents put quite a bit of responsibility on them. And so they, whether it's sports or schoolwork, um, they kind of take a back burner um, when their parent needs something from them. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll have our governing board comments, item 3.4, and we'll start at this end of the table. Um, we have a student trustee with us tonight, and that's Muriel Mamaril. Do you have anything that you'd like to say? Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. This is my first time being officially here as the student trustee, so I'd like to just formally introduce myself. Um, there was one thing that I experienced this month. It was the first week of November, 
and we attended what's called the California Association of Student Leaders Conference and we went with a bunch of other ASB groups and it was for the Central Coast area and it was a lot of um, school spirit definitely a lot of yelling <laughs> Um, but we cultivated a lot of just learning from other people and students who had the same passion of serving our schools and it was really nice um, and we we did like workshops and we heard from speakers that were really motivational and it inspired us to kind of keep furthering like the communication and also just the spirit that we have on each of our campuses so that was really nice thank you thank you trustee soto Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending tonight's meeting. I had the pleasure, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of attending the veterans' luncheon this past Friday at the Mellow Center. Uh, it was quite the ceremony. Um, you know, I met a lot of people that I didn't realize that were veterans. You know, uh, in the community like myself. Um, and then there was one individual in particular that I didn't realize the rank that he attained. Uh, and I was pretty impressed with that. Uh, this gentleman had been in the active duty service for almost 26 years, and he was kind of the head of the whole function. So, you know, it's good to to talk to folks, hear their stories, share your stories. Um, you know, it's a for me, it's a humble day, but it's a proud day as well. Um, so, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for inviting me to attend that. That was that was a pretty good. Uh, pretty good event for me. I was the last uh, person on the agenda as well, so I had the pleasure to sit through the entire ceremony and see the band play and watch the color guard and hear everybody's stories. Uh, so happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Orozco. Yeah, so I am a parent in the district, so today I got the pleasure of attending um, the fall parent-teacher conferences uh, for two of my kids. So I just want to thank our teachers for the work that you do and the effort that you put in in making that happen. And um, also providing guidance uh, to our students for those student-led student -led conferences. It just sort of builds their confidence and, um, and they were nothing but excited um, to share what uh, they've learned um, uh, this past couple of months. Um, I also attended the DLAC meeting yesterday. So there was a presentation that provided um, our DLAC parents with an overview on the after school extended learning program um, and the different types of activities offered through that program across the district. Um, and then also um, the social emotional learning opportunities that we're providing in the classroom. And of course, the counseling services and other resources available through our uh, wellness center. <clears throat> um, just speaking in regards to safe spaces, I do want to acknowledge the work of our extended learning program team. I've heard some great things from parents just out in the community about um, how, how great their experience has been so far and the fact that it sort of allows them to not have to stress out about having to run home to pick up the kids from school and so forth. So um, I know that's a, an added support for our parents um, as well as it, as it is for our students. And again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Trustee Shocker. Thank you, President DeSerba. So I wanted to say congratulations to Peggy Pugh, who is Aptos Chamber Commerce Woman of the Year. Um, she used to be our Aptos High Principal, but now she's here um, working with VAPA for the district. I um, also want to thank all the veterans for their service, um, including my father-in-law, who is a Marine, and my grandfather, grandfathers, <laughs> who have both passed, but were, were Navy men. So. Um, Lots of, of service members in my family. Um, also went to our Migrant Head Start committee meeting. Um, exciting projects happening in Migrant Head Start. They're um, working at redoing their playground area. So at Freedom Elementary, at the Migrant Center there, they'll soon have a new playground for the, for the children. Um, they're also still actively recruiting daycare providers for the migrant program. 
Also attended our district-wide green team meeting. Um, lots of ideas from community members and the team on how to make the district greener, as well as help the district um, move along in becoming an ocean guardian district, which we need cooperation from all of our schools to obtain that feat. And then I know teachers have been busy, um, parent-teacher conferences, um, report cards, so I am hoping they're getting ample prep time to prepare for those student-teacher conferences and report cards coming out. And then finally, I'd like to say this is my last meeting because I will be gone on December 7th. And thank you to the community, and I wish you all luck. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Acosta. Yes, thank you. So I just want to extend a welcome to our student trustee. And it um, certainly is a season to be grateful and thankful. So um, I, too, want to extend that gratitude to all of our um, veterans for their service um, and especially to our very own uh, trustee Soto for his service and also for your continued service to our community and public service since you've been back thank you very much and I wish everyone a wonderful happy Thanksgiving and have safe and um, troubles if you're traveling thank you thank you um, so at the beginning um, of the month I did attend the Aptos Chamber of Commerce dinner where we did honor Peggy Pugh as woman of the year and where is she Peggy where are you I saw you earlier I know you're standing in the back somewhere probably hiding oh they are okay Peggy I wanted you to come up to the podium um, we also uh, honored um, the man of the year this year was Danny Braga and if you if you don't know him you should because he's a wonderful human being he serves us well on the Aptos Sports Foundation and um, and we love them both Peggy and Danny so thank you very very much to both of them I did attend the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance Board meeting um, this month as well as the Santa Cruz School Board Associations again I'll say it's a it's an important honor that trustees have to serve on committees and I encourage all trustees who are not currently serving on committees to try um, to attend some of their committee meetings it's very important lastly I'll say that um, I want to thank everybody um, who put their hat in the ring to run for office in this county it's part of a small club it's not an easy thing to do and it's um, scary and painful sometimes personally and in other ways and so for everybody who put their name in the ring I want to say Thank you for um, your service, and thank you for wanting to serve. And here comes Peggy. Come on up, Peggy. Hi. Hi. You're awesome. Thank you. You are the woman of the year for the Aptos community. <laughs> it's a big deal. The room thank was you. packed, and everybody gave you a huge ovation. So do you have anything you want to say to us? Well, I mean, I'm just so grateful to the opportunities <laughs> that I've gotten from PVUSD. That would definitely not have happened if I had not um, had such wonderful advocates and um, supporters in the district. And I'm just grateful, so, so grateful for the community. Yeah. And Dr. Rodriguez, do you have any words that you'd like to say? Well, so Peggy um, effortlessly for so many years um, guided Aptos High. Sometimes we, she made it look easy as though being the leader of Aptos High was, was easy, but it really was her passion, dedication, long work hours, and just really effective communication skills that allowed her community to always know what was happening. And so she often got those concerns at the door and fixed them, and so they never even reached me. Um, I mean, anyone who is promoted to the district office it means that I think that they're a rock star, that I think that they have the three things that we always say, positive attitude, hard work ethic, and care about kids. If you don't have those three things, we don't want you at the district office, and she has those three things. So um, I always will say she's a rock star. Thank you. And Peggy, you know, I meet a lot of kids just in the work that I do over the years, and kids remember you. 
They remember that you were their favorite, I think, social studies or history, right, teacher, and that you always had an open door for them, and they'd come, right? They would come in and they'd eat lunch with you because um, it was a safe space. So you have really um, made a huge impact on a lot of kids. Well, it's been a pleasure to join and continue to teach. Yeah, so thank you. Congratulations. And now I want to acknowledge um, some donations um, from the following individuals who donated to our um, Emerald Lagasse Culinary Teaching and uh, Teaching Kitchen and Garden. And um, there's a lot of them, so indulge me. So to George Au and his family, $10,000. To Rudy and Mary Berghold, $5,000. From Mary Altier and John Walker, $500. From Daryl Dychek and Ken Smith, $250. Myra Eastman, $50. Jim Edens, $3,000. Elaine Greenapple, $50. Amy and David Harrington, $500. Hannah Kong, and Alden Rodriguez Adventure Fund, $250. Jeanette Labau, $100. Ellen Moore, $150. Cindy Akuji, $200. Tails Rucker, $500. Pam Shanks, $100. Allie and Nick Sutton, $100. Viola and Larry Willis, $10,000. Joanne Yablonski, $100. Rita Sanchez, $50. Dr. Manuel Carlos and Ann Wyckoff Carlos, $250. Carol and Brett Sisney, $10,000. The United Way of Santa Cruz County, um, $1,500. Brian and Randy Driscoll, $500. And Linda Sharman, $1,000. And the total of all of those was $44,150 towards the kitchen. So thank you very, very much. We're forever grateful for helping us make this a reality for kids in the Pajaro Valley. And next up, we'll have the fa our favorite part of the meeting, probably, is um, our high school student board representative reports. And we'll start with new school if they're here tonight. Are they here? OK, step up to the podium. You're going to do great. Um, hi, I'm Amy Chavez. I'm a new school student, and I'm here to present on new school's updates. Naomi, step forward a little bit so your lips are more by the mic, because it's I, well, I won't tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> we just want to hear you. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, I'm going to repeat myself. I'm sure. You got it? OK. Um, today, Andres Ruiz and Jasmine Salazar were honored as Students of the Month by Watsonville Rotary. Um, That's great. Um, our outdoor school and character development um, started like a month ago on the 20th, and today, this year's, um, this year's, uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> um, this year's theme was career exploration, and on our first day, we went to Mother's Nature's Temple, and we learned a lot about welding, um, team building, and archery. On the second day, we went to Cabrillo Construction and Energy Management, and we learned um, about the construction program. On the third day, we had our on-site day, we went um, with the city of Watsonville and cleaned our neighborhood. And we got seven pounds of trash and garbage from all our slews. Um, we also worked with Science Workshop and they helped us work on our garden projects. We also tied our shirts with for students and our community partners and we tie dye 75 shirts in total. On the fourth day, we went to Cabrillo's main campus, and we learned a lot about the horticulture and medical programs. Next up, 
tomorrow we will be going to Second Harvest. On Friday we will be going to Hartner College. Um, we will be returning back to Mother Nature's Temple for our end of program. And for our incentive trip, we will be going to Great America. We did have a lot of fun on Halloween. A lot of our students dressed up and participated. <laughs> also, our English teacher, <laughs> our English teacher, Ms. Jovi, helped us, well, taught us about, taught us how to do fake scars on ourselves. Yesterday, um, two of our new school students went to with Science Workshop um, for their trades day to Santa Cruz and helped them build projects. We also had our student-led conferences. We had 90% participation, which means 90% um, of our students went and presented their um, transcripts and presented them all to their parents. Um, we also have our Flip the Switch series, which we have a new speaker every Tuesday to talk about their experiences. <coughs> our new school, our new school founder, Albino Garcia, visited us from <coughs> Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our first quarter recognition, we had our first quarter recognition ceremony, which we recognized everyone for having their most credits earned, best attendance at Genuity Volleyball and Aztec Award. And me, myself, I did get the Aztec Award for representing and <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And that sums up all our, my, our presentation. Nicely done. Thank you. Next up, we'll have um, Renaissance High School. Sorry, stand by for technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, sorry, Renaissance. We will get you. Is PV High here? Okay. Oh, can I use this to change the slides? Okay. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. My name is Estefania. I'm the senior class president for PV High, and I'll be reporting tonight. PVHS administered the PSAT in the beginning of October for all of our 10th and 11th grade students. We appreciated being able to use the practice booklets to be able to study before the test. The College and Career Center, along with their counselors, helped create a two-week college and career celebration at PVHS. We had workshops, college preparations, career guest speakers, and an amazing college and career fair with over 30 community businesses we would also like to thank our staff, students, and parents who took the Youth Truth Survey. We had 581 students surveys, 189 parent surveys, and 59 staff surveys. PVHS offered an incentive to students who submitted the survey within the first window. Our data will be sent out by late November to PVHS staff, students, and families. We also want to congratulate our PV Nation family for all their hard work this last semester, we are recognizing 667 students for honor roll. This year, ASB purchased the Spirit Chain as a way to recognize students for going above and beyond to in Grizzly Pride. 
We have rewarded San Chavez and Catherine Burke. We have also re reopened our Grizzly Pride store where students can redeem their stickers and more. Oh, their they can redeem their five star points for items like Grizzly gear, keychains, stickers, and more. We hope to get more five star scanners. So if there's any schools that are not using the scanners, we would love to take them. Activity events. We started off by celebrating our national coming out day. Our staff and students got a chance to walk through our rainbow door as allies to the LGBTQ plus community. We also honored our Hispanic heritage with Dia de la Raza. During lunch, we had a car show, a DJ, and played games. Next came our annual homecoming week. We had events and activities all week long with the food day, noontime carnival, movie night, all school rally, VIP dance, and our first dance of the year. I'd like to give a big shout out to our staff for their performance during the rally. I didn't know they could do toe touches. <laughs> we ended October with our Halloween Spirit Week and Dia de los Muertos. To celebrate Halloween, we had 50 pumpkins donated. for our carving contest, as well as our annual costume contest. Our senior class also hosted the first ever haunted house, and our students and staff decorated the hallways with altars and beautiful flowers. Leadership was also able to attend the California Association of Student Leaders Leadership Conference in Salinas. Over 20 plus high schools and middle schools attended this conference. We cheered and chanted for our school and showed our grizzly pride. We listened to amazing speakers and got to learn about other schools and their events and activities. We presented on how ASB can be better support, better to support smaller clubs on campus and help build more clubs and activities for all students. Oh. Athletics. We want to give a big shout out to Yareli Samora, our PCAL Cypress Division Tennis Single Champion. We are so proud of you. Yareli Samora has also had an outstanding academic record. Our fall sports program ended by recognizing our seniors on their last home games. This is a hard game for most athletes and we want to make it as special as possible. We also continued to build and grow as a family when we had our volleyball and football game teams play volleyball against each other. Winter sports started and were looking good. Our soccer teams began practicing in the morning to be able to be more on the field. Having four soccer teams practice after school and racing to beat the sun is not cutting it for our sports programs. Our cheer program just had tryouts for winter and has added eight more amazing Grizzlies to the squad, one being our amazing Sin Chavez. <coughs> Upcoming events. We are starting our PV Gives campaign that includes that the food drive with the Second Harvest Food Bank, PV Adopt a Family, Santa Cruz Fair, Holiday Lights, and more. This is one of our favorite seasons because ASB really tries to focus on giving back to our community and our schools. If you are interested in participating in our adopt a family, you can speak to our activities director, Ms. Brusa. <coughs> the class of 2023 is also having a bake sale for p big potatoes. Fun Class of 2023 is also having a big potato fundraiser this Friday, November 18th from 4 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Come get your big potatoes and support PV Nation senior class. We would also like to announce that Empower Watsonville, a youth-led program that advocates for policy change within our school district with regards to substance abuse, will be having a conference on December 2nd from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Youth Center. I greatly encourage all of you to attend and possibly even bring hygiene products to donate for the cab hygiene drive that will also be hosted during this event. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. 
Is Renaissance ready to come up? Or are we ready to host them? That's <laughs> actually a better question. Good evening, superintendent and trustees. My name is Joanna. I am here on behalf of the, le of the Renaissance leadership. First, I want to thank teachers, staff, and security from Renaissance. It has been a good experience for me. I am happy I get to graduate early and start a new chapter of my life. I have learned so much, and I have gotten opportunities like being part of leadership, being able to go on field trips, playing volleyball, and even being vice president. I can't wait to see how Renaissance develops over the years. These are, uh, these are things Renaissance has done since the uh, last meeting. Volleyball has been a successful sport at Renaissance. The school has won the majority of their games. This Friday, Renaissance will play in the A division for finals. Um, basketball season starts January 20th. Renaissance students are excited for the return of basketball, which has been gone for years. S students are also excited to participate in returning sports next year, like soccer and softball. Students are thankful for the new backstop and are excited to see the restored field next, hopefully. We also had activity day the last day of the quarter. We had tutoring opportunities for students and we also had activities like volleyball, dodgeball, golf, art, movie showings, board games, and study hall. The students really enjoyed this and we are looking forward to having more activity days in the future. We also had a Halloween Spirit Week. We had dress up day, pajama day, we celebrated Dia de los Muertos, we had dress as your type day, and anything but a backpack day. Students had a chance to win prizes for the best costume and the most creative anything but a backpack. Uh, there has been a couple of field trips. Students ha from Renaissance have visited Digital Nest, Cabrillo College, Hartnell, and CTE. Students were learning about career opportunities available to them and post-secondary educational opportunities. In the interest of promoting good attendance and positive culture and additional credit earning opportunities, Renaissance Leadership has the following request. An in-person after-school program with driver's education. This means more licensed student drivers and better attendance rate. A CTE auto technician class could also be a possibility since we have an auto shop that is not being used at the moment. Students also have concerns about losing access, access to activities after meeting their academic requirements like playing sports, attending field trips, and having access to a design class. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and for helping lift up the Renaissance community. Those are great presentations. Thank you so much for coming tonight. So, so before we continue, we do mm -hmm. have a speaker to this item. Oh, okay. Monica, is it no one? Yeah. <coughs> okay, so take away yeah, the 6.1. Got it, yeah. okay. Allegedly, that is true. <laughs> All right, whatever. Um, okay, so. Sorry, I'll wait for you to start. I'm Monica Nallen. I'm the academic counselor for New School and Renaissance. I'm wearing only my Renaissance sweater, so I'm sorry, you guys. But I was at school today, so. Um, <laughs> but I, I am so proud of our students, and I'm really proud to serve them as well. I'm particularly proud of the two that came tonight to represent from both of our schools because I think their journey has been wild i feel like good and like just good wild because it's you know we and this is what these schools do and this is what pvusd does for our community with these alternative programs and so i appreciate um though they are small um that they exist and that they are thought about and that we get to come here and we get to talk with you and our students get to do that because um the impact that we get to have working with them and their families is so important. And um, I wanted both of you to know 
that <laughs> I think you're amazing. Giselle, I think you're amazing too. She's a student at Renaissance. Um, and I, I've gotten to see them grow in the last two years. They both came at the same time, but to two different schools, and they've both developed in different ways. Um, and as a staff member of these schools, I feel extremely lucky to experience it with them. And I feel that you all are very lucky to have experienced it tonight as well. And so, um, good job. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Um, next up, we'll have our approval of the agenda, item 4.1. I'm looking for a motion to approve. I move to approve. No second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries 502. Tristy Holm is um, overseas tonight, and I'm not sure where Tristy dodges. He didn't contact me tonight. Um, okay, and item 5.1 is approval of our minutes from October 26, 2022. I'm looking for a motion. Move to approve. No second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502. Thank you. Next up is our visitor non agenda items, item 6.1. This is a time for people to comment on non agendized items. Okay. Do we have any speakers? We do. We have 11 speakers to this item, so I'm going to be calling three out of time. So um, if you can please uh, line up uh, just to make the process go smoother. So first we have uh, Omar Alvarez and Brooklyn Jamas, followed by Suzanne Rose and Denise Wheeler. And that's the cutest baby I'm watching in the front row. I'm <laughs> my daughter looked so much like this, and I'm really enjoying watching her. She's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Okay, sorry. I just check. <laughs> Hello. Testing. Okay. So just in, say say what your name is and then let us know why you're here. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Brooklyn Yamas, and I am Omar Alvarez. Um, so good evening, President Kim DeSerpa, uh, Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Um, we're here on behalf of Empower Watsonville. I am the president for the our Youth Policy Cohort Number Two. And I am the secretary of um, the Empower Watsonville cohort too as well. Um, through our internship, Empower Watsonville's youth seeks out to advocate and inform um, our school's community regarding substance use and mental health. Alongside this, we strive to provide informational resources and advocate for our restorative policy for students caught using substances. We also partner with parents and school administration to help reduce the alarming rates of substances use within our youth. Um, we want to provide an announcement on behalf of our cohort where we'll be having a conference on December 2nd from 5 to 8.30. In addition to a variety of activities such as partnering with the Community Action Board, the Youth Homeless Response Team, we're also going to be having a hygiene job, um, drive where we'll be collecting soaps, deodorants, and toothbrushes. We will also be exploring distinct challenges and obstacles obstacles that the youth experience with interactive youth-led activities for the community to engage with to learn different tactics. To attribute to this, we will also be having a guest speaker, Dani Contreras, and we all hope that you're able to attend. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Suzanne Rose, and I'm a teacher at McQuitty. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about transportation. Um, this whole big thing with transportation and a shortage of bus drivers has affected us all in a lot of different ways, and especially our families. I had a field trip that was canceled. I know that doesn't sound like a lot in the scheme of things, but it really is. And now we're trying to plan another field trip that's all the way at the end of May, and we're having issues because it's the O'Neill sailing trip, and they only have certain hours in which you can go and actually get on a boat and sail and then come back and do all the lab work. 
and because of our bus driver shortage, um, we're unable to schedule buses for any of the times that are available for the field trip. Um, so we have to contract out, and when we call the contract, the transportation department, they ask us to contact Michaels, which apparently also contracts with our district because they can't drive during the hours that we need to drive either. So we have to contract out to yet another company, and the other company, we, I just this just happened this evening. I got the email back from Discovery Transportation Company, and they told us that it would cost us $1,066 for a 47-passenger bus to drive to the harbor and back during the hours in which we can go for this field trip. And then they I told us that we should plan on adding another 6 to 10% to that amount because the field trips aren't until May, and apparently they're concerned that maybe gas prices are going to keep going up like everything else. I'm not sure, but anyway. So um, O'Neill has graciously always scholarshiped us a certain amount based on past costs for buses. And in the past, apparently, we qualified for about $500 per bus. My fellow fourth grade teachers are here with me tonight. We all plan on going this field trip. It's a really important field trip for our kids. They get to go out on a sailboat. They get to go out and they get to do a bunch of different tests on the water. They learn how to use, uh, they learn how to, is that my time, is that? Anyway, real quickly, I understand that the Transportation Department has received $2.9 million, and we're hoping that some of that money can be used to fund some of these field trips since the scholarship isn't going to cover the cost of the buses. Thank, Thank you. you for hearing me tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Denise Wheeler, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at McQuitty Elementary. I'm here tonight to discuss our negotiations, but specifically class sizes. As a fifth grade teacher, my class size cap is 34 students. This year at McQuitty, our classes were set to have our 68 fifth graders divided into three classrooms of about 20 to 22 per class. Our site was fully staffed in classroom positions. However, the district determined that there was not a need for three classes. So two days before school started, they made the decision to displace a teacher at our site and move an experienced fifth grade teacher down to a lower grade level. As a result, we began our school year with 34 students in each class. This choice was very confusing to me. The district purposely overfilled our classrooms this year. During a time when there's not enough support for our struggling students, the least we should be doing is giving them the benefit of smaller class sizes. I also feel that this could make a difference in teacher retention. Fourth and fifth grade positions often sit unfilled because of the unique needs of those students. We are teaching to classes that have a span of first grade to seventh grade readers. The gaps are huge and the needs are often very hard to address. Teacher burnout is bound to happen. This week being parent-teacher conferences, I did the math. I will be doing roughly three and a half hours more conferences than any other teachers at my site. The benefit of conferences is unmatched and it's been a positive experience. However, we do get tired. Class sizes in elementary schools need to all be the same. And if you are not willing to make this change, then I hope there's a plan to make it more fair to the teachers that are putting in extra hours to meet the needs of our 34 students. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. So uh, next up we have Kaylin Johnson, Cece Kalenda, and Sarah Graham Legions. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm happy to be here in person for the first time in years. Uh, the mission of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is to educate and support learners in reaching their highest potential. The best way to do that is to attract and retain high quality educators. The best way to do that is to pay a good salary and improve working conditions. So um, I've been working, I've been teaching for PVSD for 25 years, and if I, I've done my research, if I worked at a, many of our neighboring districts, I'd make from a couple thousand to $10,000 more a year. 
with my level of experience. Um, and those nearby districts don't have the staffing shortages that we have, and I think the main reason is because they pay better. Those ongoing staffing shortages, partially caused by, not, by low pay, are taking a toll on our students. I've been at Lakeview this, this year, and some of our students are in their second year without a regular teacher for one to four subjects. Um, instead, they get a revolving door of subs, including someone like myself. I've had one week this year where I haven't had to sub one to three times during my prep. And not only does that take a toll on the students uh, who don't have a regular teacher, but the lack of prep time and the extra work comes out of what I could be offering my students. Um, I can't do all the work and sub at the same time. So um, there's other staffing shortages that affect me as a teacher as well. We don't have enough custodials, so I'm cleaning my own classroom. We don't have enough campus supervisors. We don't have enough office staff. We don't have enough bus drivers. All of those have an impact on our students and on our teachers and on, the, and on learning. And I'm hoping that you'll raise our salaries. Thank you. might need those two seconds <laughs> all right so good evening my name is CC Kalenda I'm a sped teacher for the district I work for rise at the elementary level and I also facilitated one of our PDs last month for elementary release teachers um, and specifically about how to support students with IEPs so I'm here this evening on behalf of my elementary release colleagues because some teacher and student needs came up in the PD. But we didn't just come up with challenges, we also came up with some solutions. One of those is to make different use of our professional development time at the beginning of the year. So we know through research that an effective way to develop equitable practices is to have PDs that address student needs and give to teachers a time to collaborate. And based on this, we're suggesting one small change. Instead of spending a half or full day on something like intellectual preparation, school communities can come together and talk about and develop strategies to support students with special needs. So if we look at this through the theoretical lens of targeted universalism, then we can lift up all of our students by helping our most vulnerable populations. So what could this really look like? It would be not an IEP meeting. It would be a school community meeting where release teachers, yard duties, um, food service, custodians, security, and of course, gen ed and sped teachers could come together. Our job as teachers would be to share student needs and to develop strategies that would benefit both individual students and an entire classroom at the same time, but we need time to do this. And asking SPED teachers and release teachers and any other teachers to know how to serve students by having a list of accommodations in their box just doesn't cut it for equity. So we want to be able to implement inclusive practices. We want to support all of our students. We want a strong school community, and we're asking that the, the district be Thank mindful you. in future PD planning so that we can make this Thank happen. You. Good evening. Um, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and President DeSerpa and the board for having me. It's nice to see everyone. I recognize people from the community and my Facebook feed, so good to see everyone. Um, so I came with like a plan thing I was gonna say, but I think I'm just going to focus on one thing. Um, this has been a very challenging year for myself. Um, I've taught fifth grade for six years and I was given two days notice that you are now going to be teaching first grade and moving to a new classroom. And um, we're gonna give you zero time to figure out what the curriculum's like or to move your stuff or anything like that or to even get to know what a first grade brain is like. And I just had a baby, I have two other kids. I just felt like my humanity wasn't taken into consideration. We preach social emotional learning for our students. Well, we need to do that for our teachers. Um, also, 
when people come and visit my classroom, I would love if they said, wow, Ms. Legions, you are doing an amazing job. We are so impressed with you. I would feel so good every day to get one compliment, just like we try and give our students a compliment every day. Thank you. <laughs> also, Tina Morgan should be your next appointee to superintendent. She makes me feel great every day. She loves kids, and she's incredible. Is that all for? Yeah. Oh, there's more. Oh, okay. Then we have more. So we have Gina Deshira, followed by Jora Feldman and Melissa Denise. I'm watching. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gina Deshira. I've been a teacher at Lakeview since Lakeview opened, and I just want to say the last two years have been horrible. I am worn out. Uh, we've had to sub on an average of every other day. We've had vacancies that have gone on and on and on. And like my colleague said, we have groups of students who have a revolving door, as she said, of substitute teachers. And these are the most vulnerable students. Last year, it was an ELD class where they're not getting an elective and instead they're getting a parade of substitutes all day all year long, which does them great disservice. And here we are again, another year, the same story. Every morning at 8.15, I check to see if I have to sub. And who's losing? I'm losing my prep, so what? But those students are losing their education. And what's my solution? I know there's a shortage here, but you have qualified, credentialed people in non-essential positions. It is all hands on deck. We need to all be working with kids. No matter who you are, administrators, TOSAs, everybody needs to be in charge of kids. And that's, that's the bottom line. And I disagree that getting moved to the district office is some kind of promotion. The, the kingdom is in the classroom, and that's where we all need to be. And I hope that we, next year, take priority with the classroom and fill those vacancies with our highly qualified people that we have here and that we raise our salaries so that we can recruit and retain the highly qualified teachers we have. Please, go back to the classroom, everybody. All right, good evening. Thank you for having me. And also, I wanted to start by thanking you. The, the bonuses have helped, but I, but I want to try to make it a little bit better. We forgot some of the people who earn nearly minimum wage in our district, who work a three-hour split shift every day, who are the first person who that kid who's having trauma at home goes and talks to, and who are the person who people trust in the community more than they trust somebody who's commuting in and who grew up elsewhere, um, our yard duty supervisors. We have three of them today here with us. They, because they were not, they do not have the, have not had the option in the past of joining one of the unions, they were not included in the bonuses. These are people who were basically paying $15 an hour and who can make that bonus go much farther in their lives. I went, we went to dinner tonight. I had other things I was gonna tell you, but we went to dinner tonight, and dinner was talking about the kids, the bizarre things that happen at recess, the need to pull the principal out of their principalship jobs and put them on the playground if Carmen, Lupita, or Adriana are missing, because that's where we need the people the most. The, the, strange relationships. The one kid who will not listen to anybody, including me, but will listen to Adriana and is trying to grow up with that. The fact that Carmen was there when I showed up, and that's at least 13, 14 years ago, something like that. Surely these are the people who we should be providing a retention bonus to and for whom the retention bonus can go farthest. And on a personal note, the first time I wore a tie was to a school board meeting, and it was this one. <laughs> um, hi.
Hi, I'm Melissa Dennis. I teach at Ohlone Elementary, and I'm here to speak on behalf of our wonderful yard duties. Um, I just found out that yard duties did not get the retention bonus that other staff received, and I just don't think it's fair. Um, I'd like Ms. Adriana and um, Ms. Lupita to stand up and say hello, please. <laughs> and and um, this is my good friend, Ms. Carmen. Um, yard duty supervisors make the least and that bonus would make the most difference for them. Our yard duty supervisors work tirelessly day in and day out helping teachers, administrators, and especially students. They are probably too shy to speak and they're very humble and they're very hardworking. Um, but these women do so much more than just watch kids at recess and cut and serve the fruit. They counsel our students when they're sad or having problems. We have a few students who have social emotional challenges and only our yard duty supervisors can help them. They volunteer tirelessly. They help us with picture day, dental checkup day. They stay late with us at carnival. They work in our book fair. They help us with our tamalada. They man our otter store. They bring donations of food and toys for our events. That's not, I don't even have enough time to describe all that they do. So let's do right by our least paid and most underrepresented yet most impactful staff members. Let's give the bonus to these hardworking women. They need and deserve it the most. She's, she's been here for 18 years. <laughs> okay, so the, our last three speakers for this item, we have Roddy Kickerman, we have Donna Lefevre, and that's it. Two speakers. Put it in for 7.1. Okay, so you want me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Apologize. Okay, so we're, we're good. Uh, Lefevre. Yes. All right. Um, hello. My name is Donna Lefevre. I'm a teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, I want to start with some celebrations because the kids are the reason that I work every day. I work so hard for them and they're amazing. Um, the cross country team that I help coach, uh, they, the girls team qualified for state and that was amazing. That was so amazing to watch. Yeah, the work that they put in this whole season, I, it's amazing. And then the head coach, the work that he put in to make sure that he was able to focus on every aspect of every practice to push them to this limit. I mean, the girls team has never gone to state before in the history of Watsonville High School, so it's amazing. Um, I also wanna celebrate, one of my students um, was here, but they were talking about um, Empower Watsonville and the kinds of issues that our students take on because they recognize the problems, they see it in their friends, they're trying to be there for them, and they take on these big issues, these big problems happening in the community, like substance abuse. That's huge. And they're taking that on. It's so impressive. So now I'm gonna come to the place where on Thursday, there were 25 uh, teaching positions that needed to be filled. Um, there were 25 absences for whatever reason. And there, that didn't get filled. Um, I, I was out sick yesterday and I'm recovering and uh, my fourth period had to end up in the Mellow Center. Um, we are not doing the things that we need to do to support these kids that are amazing. They're stepping up and solving these problems that a lot of us have always felt are just unmanageable. So we as adults need to step up. The kids are stepping up, we need to step up. A recommendation I have, anyone in the district, go to the school sites that need subs, just plop someone in a classroom. They can do their work from there with their laptop and manage the kids so that the teachers can get the prep time and provide the support they need for those kids. Thank you. Next up we have uh, employee organization comments. And we'll start with Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, item 7.1. Good, 
Good evening, board, Dr. Rodriguez, um, President De Serpa. Uh, first, I want to start off with um, maybe CSEA can get to go first one of these nights. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so I just I want to start off with um, saying thank you to um, Jennifer Shocker for the years that you've um, committed to being on the board for working with um, all of the stakeholders and um, doing your best to communicate with them and to to represent our students, um, our staff, and our community of learners. So thank you. Um, and also, congratulations to, Ms. to Kim DeSerpa for um, continuing to represent your, the community in your seat. Um, you've done important work in the past, and I'm sure that you'll do important work in the future, and we look forward to working with you. Um, and so, I, I'll just give you a little update. Um, currently, as Maria Orozco um, pointed out, she's a parent of the community, so she went to a parent conference. Our elementary teachers are working really, really hard, um, working late hours to meet with parents. Um, when I was an I started out in this district um, as an elementary teacher, and there were many nights where my parents, because they worked in agriculture and they weren't getting home until 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night, so I would be with my two kids in my classroom um, and, and meeting with parents at 7 o'clock at night on occasion. So um, our elementary teachers do put in some amazing hours during parent conference week all the time. All of our teachers do. Our secondary teachers are working diligently um, towards this uh, end, of, end of the first semester that is inclusive of many projects that they're doing with their students, um, filling in the many vacancies um, or the absences during the day um, and in their week, maybe multiple times, as you've heard. Um, and then they're administering uh, the many assessments that they administered so that they can ensure that their students are progressing accordingly. So all of these activities that our teachers and our counselors and our school nurses, um, all of our support staff um, do are very important as they all are activities that empower and lift up our students. So when we have people who are missing, it shows. Um, and so what we're hearing is the continued loss of prep time. Our people, so what I'm hearing from our members is you can't be your best self when every single day you are, um, your time is so, is, is exhausted. You lose your prep. So then now you're behind on your grading. Now you're behind on your lesson planning. We have families that we go to. And if we don't have a family at home that we go to, we have a life <laughs> that we need to recharge. You've already heard me speak to this before. So you can't be your best self if you don't have that space to reconnect with yourself at the end of your school day or at the end of your day. So um, it's very, very challenging when um, our classes are not supported the way that it's communicated out to the public that they are supported. So the public may hear, oh, we have this many people in this position. Okay, you, that means you have that many positions that you're willing to, um, that you're able to employ. But that doesn't mean that all those positions are open, that, are, that they're filled. For instance, our school nurses. We should have 11 across this district. I think right now we maybe have eight. Um, but so anything that's printed for the community to see, it has a number of what the ideal is. So how does this affect our um, staff, our, our school sites on the daily? Well, then people get pushed around. Our classified get pushed around to here and there. We need you to go over there. We need you to go to do this. And it might not even be within their class, their, their job description. And then it's pulling that resource away from the classroom that maybe they might need to be in. That would be their actual job um, placement. Um, so that, you know, impacts our students. So you've heard our teachers talk about that. Um, and, and so earlier, I'll end with this. So earlier, <laughs> uh, we had, we opened up our, our office so that teachers, because the, you know, the meetings are late, so teachers have a place to go and relax, you know, outside of their classroom and before coming here. And 
as I was doing my work in my office, I could hear them talk about how to improve, make improvements at their sites. And what that spoke to was that although we communicate these things, we're not being heard. And we have an amazing array of professionals across this district that are actually in the number Thank one you, position um, in working with our students directly that should be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Is CSEA here tonight? Yes, oh, I'm sorry okay. about that. Yeah, hi. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, oh, Board of speaking, Trustees. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, you are a speaker to, to, to this PBFT. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so um, as you all know, I am the Chief Negotiator for PBFT and we are currently in negotiations with the district. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that, but before I do, I want to just say, and I think you must all know this if you're in the education field, that the number one factor that affects students' learning and success is the relationships they have with the people on campuses. There are so many studies that show that it is not the curriculum that is adopted, it is not the technology, it is not the dress code, it is not all of those other things that we put so much time and effort to. It is the people. So last year, over a hundred of our educators left PVUSD. A majority of them stated that it was the salary and the working conditions. In order for us to retain the highly, highly qualified people that you heard from tonight, they need to know that they can support themselves, they can support the, their families, and that they're gonna be treated with respect. As professionals who have very advanced degrees and credentials and, and are prepared to do what they need to do for students. I had a member share with me that a student returned to the elementary site that she was working at and she was the only teacher working there still that worked with that student. We need to do better, a lot better. Um, I put together some statistics to share with you. Since 2016, the cost of renting a two bedroom has increased by an average of 11.3%. The median home price has increased by 11%. The ending reserve balance of the district has increased by an average of 11%. And the teacher salary at step 10, column three, has an increased by an average of 2.2%. Thank you. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Item 7.2, is there anyone here tonight from the California School Employees Association? Okay, moving on to item 7.3, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Good evening. Hi. President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. I'm Heather Gorman, SELPA Director. So tonight I'd like to share with you how our special education administrators are supporting the whole family through the work that we're doing with our Community Advisory Committee, our CAC. CAC meets monthly and the CAC provides an important connection between the community and special services. In September, I did a presentation on the IEP process for parents and parents' rights. The IEP is a process that can be a bit overwhelming and at times um, can be confusing for parents. My goal was to make sure that parents had a general understanding of all of the steps in the IEP process so they feel comfortable asking questions, stating concerns, and giving feedback to their teams. I also discussed parent rights the parental rights are given at each annual IEP, but they are not always discussed. In October, Heather Morin, our administrator for social behavioral and intensified programs, and Mark Wensler, our lead behaviorist, presented on evidence-based practices and visual supports. Visual supports are one of the interventions that have 
Evidence of Efficacy in Promoting Positive Outcomes for Learners with Autism. After the presentation, parents went to stations and created visuals for their use at home. I'm happy to have the experience of Mark and Heather for presentations and activities like this. Yesterday, for our November meeting, we met at one of, in one of our new portables at Duncan Holbert School. Nicole Salas Cunha, one of our new program directors, presented on the benefits of creating a routine and schedules at home. This is important this time of year with longer vacations and times coming up. After the presentations, family were given the opportunities to make schedules specific to what they may need at home. When we want to make sure that parents are leaving with tools they can use at home to support their children. In December, Phil Menchaca, another new program director, will be focusing the meeting on graduation pathways for students with IEPs. We will have high school students and parents attend this meeting together to create a plan for students who may be credit deficient. During this evening, we will set up scheduled times with families to go over options for graduation. Supporting families to be able to continue best practices at home is one of the main goals of the Special Services Administrative Team. Thank you. And is there anyone here tonight from the Communication Workers of America? Okay, moving on to item eight, report and discussion items. We'll hear first from uh, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance regarding the California Healthy Kids Survey and Services. Good evening, everyone. My name is Luz Sotelo. I am here on behalf of PUPSA. I am the Youth Policy Program Coordinator, um, and we're here to provide information from the California Healthy Kids Survey from 2020 and 2021 and our implement implementation plan for this new upcoming year. Yeah, and good evening, everyone. Um, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez in the PVUSD community. I'm Ben Slider, Coordinator of Student Services, and I'll also uh, lend a little bit of information in terms of our implementation for the Healthy Kids Survey uh, this year. So, oh. so today's presentation will go over the purpose of the California Healthy Kids Survey the role that PVPSA and PVUSD has with implementing the California Healthy Kids Survey, the data from our prior year, and the implementation plan, our modules, and the areas of focus. So what is the purpose of the California Kids Survey? It is the large statewide survey of resiliency, protective factors, risk behaviors, and school climate in the nation. This survey is also has data on several topics related to a student's health behaviors and academic performance. The survey is cited by state policymakers and the media as a critical component for school improvement efforts. This data will also help us when we also apply for new grants and it is also used to assess progress for one of the goals for PVUSD which is the LCAP and that is to promote a safe, supportive and positive school environment to encourage positive behavior and increase student sense of connectedness. So our role as PVPSA and for PVUSD is it's a requirement to administer as stupe grantees for every other year. PVUSD and PVUSD, PVPSA and PVUSD staff will coordinate the rollout and implementation implementation of the surveys throughout all school sites and PVPSA will act as a liaison be between West Education and the school district to obtain reports. The California Healthy Kids Survey targets um, four transitional years for students. We target fifth and seventh grade as they are the natural baseline for comparisons in teenage years. We also target ninth graders as they're typically the first year of college and have a high prevalence of alcohol or drug use. And 11th graders were selected because research shows they're virtually the students that um, if they have wanted to try alcohol or drugs, they would have done so by that grade. 
and the um, Healthy Kids Survey for 2020-2021 was not implemented for fifth graders as it was done for the prior year in 2018-2019. Um, so these are the modules. Um, it is the secondary schools, alcohol and other drugs, drug few communities, and the social emotional health module. The elementary school module is similar to the secondary module, however, the words are simpler and more age appropriate. We do not include any mental health in regards to su suicide as we do in secondary surveys. Um, however, we do ask about sadness in, in order to assess mental health. This survey is voluntarily and we do need approval for fifth graders and for the rest of the grades, it is a passive consent. These core modules are key questions that are important for schools to guide in order to have assessment in to improve academic health prevention programs and promote student achievement, positive development, and the well-being. We also want to assess scope of substance use and mental health. One of the new things um, that was implemented for the 2018-2019 was also asking about the quality of sleep um, the high school suicide ideation to the middle school survey and modifying words for two e-cigarette questions in perceived to use and added the word jewel as an example for an e-cigarette use item. Sure. So we're just going to go through this data. You'd already seen this last year. so. Um, we're just going to go through the data really quickly just to get through it, and then if uh, you have any questions afterwards, you can ask specifically about the data. Uh, and, and more importantly, we want to lead to what our implementation is to be able to improve numbers. So you're going to see numbers that are going to feel a little bit alarming. Just keep in mind that this survey uh, is given every other year, and it was given during the year of distance learning. And so where we would traditionally have higher numbers, um, those numbers dropped a little bit. Um, partly because of the implementation of having students do the survey at uh, their home. So to add on to that, um, based on the target sample for 2018-2019, um, we had for seventh graders, we had a 50% um, do the survey for seventh graders. For ninth graders, based on this target sample, we had 85%. And for grade 11, based on the sample that responded, 44. And for non-traditional, 54%. For 2020, 2021, for grade 7, we had 52%. Grade 9, we had 62%. Grade 11, 52%. And for non-traditional, 38%. So we have seen an increase for non-traditional um, but for the other grades, we've seen a slight decrease, and we also have our projected goal um, for 2022 and 2023 to at least obtain at least half of the respondents for this upcoming um, Healthy Kids Survey. And, and just, just to add to that, ideally we want everyone to be able to respond to it, uh, but we also want to make sure that we put SMART goals in place and make sure that our goals are obtainable. But we will give everyone that opportunity where that is within the grade level to be able to um, do this Healthy Kids Survey this year. We have one of the modules. It is the School Connectedness. This was through um, Agree or strongly, strongly Disagree. I mean, Agree, sorry. Um, so non-traditional students reported feeling more connected in school. We had a 19% increase. And for the following grades, um, we had a kind of decrease. Um, 11th grade went from 53% to 44 in the last prior survey, 9th grade 60% to 58%, and 7th grade to si from 63 to 59%. Um, we had stated prior that the 5th graders were not surveyed. Um, so for the 2018-2019, 5th graders had responded 60% to 73%, so we had an increase. Um, we want to see how they would do this coming time. Um, and then I also had a question about caring adults in the school. Um, the question was if there's a teacher or student in, some, um, in the school who really cared 
about them or notice if they had something to say. Um, for the 2020 and 2021, we had about 63% of schools across all school uh, grades feel like there was a teacher or someone on campus who cared about them. So that was a good 9% um, increase from the prior survey. We also have the school engagement and support. Um, these are the results that show an increase in students feeling very safe or safe at school across all grades. Aside from 11th graders, um, we had a decrease from 63 to 50%, so that was a difference of 13%. Um, all other grades remained relatively around the two to 10% increase. Um, and this question pertained how, how safe do you feel when you are at school? One of the other questions pertaining to this graph was um, in the past 12 months, were there any weapons possessions on school property? Um, if they had seen someone carrying a gun, knife, or other weapon, um, seventh grade decreased by 6%, so 15 to 9. Ninth grade decreased by 10 from 16% to 6. Eleventh grade decreased by 2%, and non-traditional increased by 5%. And we also have the mental health risk. This is a social emotional health module. Um, this bar represents the percentages of responders who were experiencing chronic sadness or hopelessness. The question pertaining to this graph was, during the past 12 months, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless, hopelessness almost every day for two weeks or stop doing some of the, your usual activities? Results increased in sad and hopelessness feelings among students of all grades. Um, and I think it also has to do with the pandemic. We know a lot of students were feeling lonely um, because they didn't have the social interaction, so that might be. So it would be interesting to see what we can get from this upcoming survey. And we have the alcohol and other drug lifetime use. The alcohol use was reduced across the board. However, for non-traditional students, it increased from 27 to 41%. Um, and the question pertaining to this graph was how much do people risk harming themselves physically or in other ways when they do the following? We also have marijuana. Marijuana use also declined ac across the board um, between a 4% to 12% variation. Non-traditional students decreased from 50% to 44, 11th graders from 28 to 22, ninth graders from 21 to 9 percent, and seventh graders from 8 percent to 4 percent. For our tobacco use, the question was if they have ever used vape products, e-cigarettes decreased by seven per decreased with seven percent. Um, it also pertained to the question of perceived harm from cigarette smoking and perceived harm of e-cigarette use compared to smoking. So um, the graph really demonstrates that for non-traditional students, there was an increase and there was a decrease for all other grades. Any comments? So um, next we'll just kind of speak to what our plan is for um, the upcoming year. So we recognize that um, the data that we have is incomplete because not all students uh, had responded and we saw a dramatic um, decrease in the number of students that would participate. So our plan is to boost those numbers up. And one of the things that we're gonna do that's significantly different compared to the past, you wanna make that go forward? is that um, Student Services is really going to collaborate with PVPSA who um, really takes the lead on uh, the Healthy Kids Survey and one of our first approaches is we are, have already reached out to the school sites that would be implementing this and we're gonna ask them to have a point person that lead for the Healthy Kids Survey to be able to um, meet with us uh, with at least two meetings that are going to help them with the planning and the implementation and the structures around it. Um, ideally, that's going to be uh, an administrator from one of the from one of the sites. Uh, so we'll be identifying um, site coordinators to help with the administration, um, and then our plan is to you know hold a couple meetings, get the training up, get the planning up, and then we will be doing an, an administration in early spring. Uh, the early parts of February 
And of course, the goal is to be able to increase the uh, percentage all the way across. And one of the reasons why we want to do this is based on what we have um, some input. We have, we, have, we have student voice, we have community voice, uh, and we have um, school staff voice. So I'm going to let you go ahead and read through that. Um, so we have three different perspectives. Um, we have one from a recent PVUSD graduate, um, and she said, taking surveys and responding honestly is super important as it allows the district to get an accurate representation to the students in order to cater them to the best ability. Um, we also have an administrator, Juan Alcantar, who's the principal at Pajaro Middle School, and he said the California Healthy Kids Survey allows us as a school to get a sincere reading of how our students are feeling about our school culture. It allows us to adjust our teaching and interactions with our students in order to create a learning environment that improves student engagement and the mental well-being. And we have Sandra Maldonado, who's a parent of PVUSD students. Surveys allow for sincere answers and provide insights on what is working and what needs to improve. Um, and we really wanted to capture these voices because um, not only their opinion on um, doing these surveys, but also just kind of backing up on our logo, right? And PVPSA, we're a community. We want to together lift up and also promote safe, positive school environments um, that encourage pos you know, positive behavior and really connect our students more with our work. So um, PVPSA and PVUSD has had a partnership and I think we're doing really great and this would just add on to the bonus of how we we can make our students we feel more comfortable and connected to us. Any questions? Thank you. We'll see if we have any speakers to this item. We do not. Okay, any questions from the board members? Noriel? Hi. Um, Hi. So I heard that, you, or I listened that and you guys said that you would work with administrators at each school site. Um, what about the students, like how would you kind of reach out and get their opinions on stuff? Or is that, because I know um, at Empower, they're doing interviews right now for mm -hmm. um, a group that's going to be working, I I'm think it's with this survey as well. Um, so for Empower, they're actually doing interviews um, for the tobacco um, youth and for the coalition. Um, for this implementation, I'm not quite sure. Maybe, Ben, you would have more of a background of how we can have student um, implementation for school sites or sure. how that would look like. Yeah, I mean, I can add to that. So one thing that I would say is that, you know, there, there are some logistical aspects to it in the processes of being, of being able to get a, a big survey done uh, across several schools. So at the high school level, we're talking two grade levels. In the middle school level, we're talking one. In the elementary, we're talking one. I think where the biggest uh, benefit would be in bringing students in and hearing their voice around that is um, having that opportunity of looking over the results together and seeing what's going on. And then from those results, we can um, do some real thinking and some brainstorming and planning because what we're talking about is hearing student voice but through, through a survey. And the benefit of doing surveys is that you can hear a lot of voices from students all at the same time. So I think the real benefit will be the conversation after the survey results come in. And would that look like maybe meeting in person and just collaborating with the people who have kind of implemented that survey? Sure, yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be great. Um, we, we know that, uh, good data out is based on good processes in. And so, um, you know, we're hoping to be able to get a larger number of students to respond. But if we um, feel like there, there, there could be some adjustments to the practices, um, certainly we would be open to um, hearing that and making those, those adjustments. Um, you know, every single site will have to kind of figure out how that will work at their site in, in bringing that student voice in and having those conversations. But of course, we can certainly help out with um, maybe some ideas and some structures and stuff like that, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, just to add on that, I think it's super important to include youth voice. I'm really proud that you brought that up because you know I think your voice would be more powerful than us just going to school and say, here, do this survey. But 
if we have youth voice at every school site saying, hey, this is important, like we need to do this, I feel like we would get more responses. So I'm glad that we probably can work something out in order to make that work. Any other questions? Trustee Roscoe, do you have any questions? Can we go back to the slide where the, I think it was the 11th graders, there was a, is it school connectedness? No. Where was it? It was, I think they were the only ones that experienced like a significant decrease. School safety. Was it school safety? Yes. Um, if not that school connectedness, go back to school safety. Was I there um, in a specific reason cited among that decrease or what, what we attribute that decrease? Um, it's just interesting how you know, at all other grade levels, their sense of safety and school engagement increased, but just that particular grade level, there seems to be a pretty <coughs> big gap there. The one thing I could extrapolate mm -hmm. is that because they're the older of the students, this was during um, the pandemic, so we were actually, we were in distance learning this whole year, is that they had more leniencies and more independence from their parents' point of view. And so because of that, they may have felt actually a less safety um, mm -hmm. because they were, they had the ability to be out in the community um, at a higher level for more hours than they would if they would have been within school. That's just, just having, just living here within Watsonville and knowing my own neighborhoods, um, we had older students that were um, frequently moving about the city much more than they usually would if they would have been in school. But that's um, it's just an assumption on my part. Okay. Do you have enough? Do you guys think of another thing? No, I mean that's where my mind was going to go to is that you know once you get that driver's license and you're 16 years old, or um, once you get old enough and your parents give you a little bit more independence and freedom, um, you know you're you're out and about more. Uh, you know during this year, um, you know. I'm sure that there are a number of juniors and seniors that were out uh, more frequently than our ninth graders and our 10th graders. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Soto or Costa, any questions? Comments? Okay, thanks for presenting it. Okay. Um, I've seen this presentation multiple times over the years. It's really um, critical to get this feedback so we know where to focus intervention and prevention efforts. So I look forward to to seeing the results of the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Marielle has one more question. One more yes. question. Um, looking at this graph, like, is there any plans of expanding it to like all the grade levels too? I'm not sure, just because I think for the requirements, we only target those specific transitional. Mm -hmm. um, so like the fifth graders um, and seventh graders because they're like more of the teenage years and then we get the ninth graders who are, are transitioning from middle school into high school, so they're more prone to try new things. Um, and then 11th graders, um, because um, you know if they haven't tried it throughout their lives, maybe by 11th we know that may they did or they didn't, um, but I'm not sure. Um, so, oh, I answered okay. that actually. So because this is actually a state required mm -hmm. assessment and the grade levels are predetermined by the state. So that's why we do the youth truth survey and we do it every grade level each year and so we're going to actually be presenting to the board um, probably two um, two board meetings from now and we had over 14,000 responses um, and so with that um, over 80 percent of our students took the survey and that is um, all grades third through 12th so you'll and it it asks a lot of very similar questions so you'll see that data so we transitioned, um, we've now done Youth Truth. This is the fourth year that we've done Youth Truth. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is item 8.2, our annual Williams report. 
Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. This evening, Santa Cruz County Office of Education is here to present the annual Williams report uh, that they walk through the schools in September. So at this time, I'm going to hand the mic over to Mr. Richard Reed and Mr. Brian Wall. Thank you, sir. Oh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. have mostly good news for you. Um, what we do is a snapshot of classrooms and um, the state comes out with a list of schools that need to be visited and uh, the county office is mandated to do those visits. Uh, the hardest part for, I think for the schools is that it has to be done in the first 20 days of school which really impacts the sites you know to, to prep for a, a meeting of that sort. Uh, just a quick uh, some quick acknowledgments here thank you Lisa for and your team for expediting our visits. Um, M&O for um, your attendance and your, and your great input. Uh, Sergio was at a, every one of our visits and had great information for us and let us know when there were work orders in and ready to go. Uh, the site, uh, your site administrators were well prepped and uh, made us feel very welcome. Uh, the teaching staff was just incredible. Uh, kids were all engaged and uh, really amazing teaching going on. And I uh, just wanted to comment that PV does an excellent job with uh, making sure that all, all kids have the instructional materials they need. Um, so these are the things we look for, and I'm going to try to keep this brief for you because I know it's getting late. Um, so one of the things I just mentioned is that we determine if students have sufficient uh, standards aligned materials in, our, in the core subject areas, English, language, arts, math, history, social science, science. We also determine if the facility condition poses any kind of emergency for kids. We didn't find that to be the case. Uh, Richard can talk about that more um, if you have any questions. We also determine if the school has provided accurate data on annual school accountability report cards, SARC, related to the sufficiency of instructional materials and safety, and we found that to be the case as well. We also want to make sure that um, the uniform complaint process, UCP posters are up and uh, in your district, they're in English and Spanish in every classroom we visited, every snapshot that we took, uh, they were there and uh, posted where people could see them. Um, and then we uh, also determine if there are teacher misassignments and that's an ongoing process with our two HR departments. So the schools we visited this year, did you want to say anything at this point, Richard? Okay. Schools you visited this year were, were far fewer. You had 19 last year. This year you just had Calabasas, EA Hall, McQuitty, PV High, and Rolling Hills Middle School. Um, I just have to say that um, in each of the cases, everything was, everything was in place, everybody was prepared, and we found no, no deficiencies. Um, there are going to be a new list in, in uh, spring 2023. We're not sure exactly what that list is going to look like, but it, it will probably have some additions, not necessarily from your district, but we had new schools added this year in other districts, um, and uh, because they've changed the parameters since the, uh, since the old, you know, no child left behind years. So uh, we may see some more schools. We, we're, we're really not sure at this point. Uh, at that point, I'll turn it over to Richard if you have anything to say about the facilities. Good evening, Pre President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. It was a pleasant visit this year. We got to see lots of construction projects going on. It was nice to see heating being improved at Calabasas and new roofs. Nice to see new shade structures. And it was a very, very good set of visits this year. The schools look great. Do you have any questions? We have one speaker to this item. Roddy, wait, wait. Is, is your presentation complete? Yes, it is. Point? Okay, we do have a speaker then. Okay, all right, thank Just you. Just checking. And then you might have some questions from the board. Sure. Good evening again. I want to speak to the part of this report that uh, deals with teacher misassignments and vacancies. So, because according to the report, there were no vacancies. Um, however, on the Williams complaint form, a vacancy reads, as a semester begins in a teacher uh, position to which a single designated certificated employee has not been assigned at the beginning of the year for the entire year, or if the position is for one semester course, a position to which a single designated certificated employee has not been assigned at the beginning of the semester for that entire semester. Now, EA Hall is one of the schools that is listed on this report. And if you recall, 
On August 24th, this board approved an MOU for an additional signing bonus for EA Hall, as that was one of the sites that had a higher than normal number of vacancies. Currently, a a EA Hall has a language arts vacancy. So I guess I'm just curious and wondering how a report can come forward stating that there are no vacancies when in fact there are. Thank you. Do we have any um, board comments or questions for the team from the COE? Well, I can just speak to that. Um, so we usually do. You want to come back up to oh, the mic? Because sure. we're um, live streaming this over. Oh, okay, sorry. Usually what happens is that these reports that we get from our HR department come much later. Mm -hmm. So it's not a snapshot at the time. So um, we, we hear from our HR department in comparison. So if there is a discrepancy there, it's because we don't get this information till the very last minute before we present to you. So it's not at the moment that, you, that we visit. It comes later. Does anyone else have any, anything? No? Okay, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have item 8.3, PVUSD Sunshine Proposal to the California School Employees Association, or CSEA, Chapter 132 for the 2021, 2020 through 2024 school year. Yes, thank you, President Serpa Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So in front of you tonight is another Sunshine proposal for hours and overtime with CSEA. We are already in negotiations. It's been open. We've been at the table. Um, we're working well together, um, but oftentimes during the course of, of negotiations, um, other articles come up or other things we need to try to solve while the contract's open, and so that's what this is. Um, since we were already open, um, we did follow the process of being able to um, pr share proposals with them. We notified the public within 24 hours, and then now it's on the board item for you as a sunshine proposal. So um, this, again, is just to inform the public that we are sunshining the hours and um, overtime article with CSEA. Any speakers? None. Okay, any questions from the board? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. Oh, wait, this is nothing. <laughs> this is not an action. Is that you can try to make a motion, but it's going to go nowhere. Um, okay, item 8.4, first reading of the board policy and administrative regulation for education for homeless children, uh, 6173. Good evening again, uh, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, thank you very much for giving me some time to um, speak to proposed changes for board policy and administrative regulation on education for homeless children, 6173. So just a little bit of background um, within this district. Uh, the existing homeless uh, student board policy and administrative regulations were approved in the May of 2010, what we have in, in place right now. The current and improved board policy 6173 and its administrative regulations were consistent with the McKinney-Vento Act when it was reauthorized during the No Child Left Behind era. Uh, currently, language in the McKinney-Vento uh, Act went into effect in 2016 when reauthorized under the Every Student Succeeds Act. A major focus of the McKinney-Vento Act is respond is responding to the needs of children and youth experiencing homelessness from birth to the transitioning to higher education. Another focus of the McKinney-Vento Act under the Every uh, Student Succeeds Act is the need for secondary school youth who are homeless to be college and career ready and the importance of school staff in supporting uh, homeless youth in the goal of college and career readiness, um, including uh, supporting in the transition into post-secondary. Um, additional emphasis is focused on the district's liaison. Um, I happen to be the district's liaison uh, role for support, supporting homeless students within the district. The proposed draft includes recommended, uh, recommended language from the California Department of Education, which is consistent with the updates to the McKinney-Vento Act reauthorized 
uh, under the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you may have about the proposed draft. Um, if the, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to answer any questions. Um, and just uh, to take note, uh, this month is November, which happens to be Homeless Awareness Month uh, as well. And so it seems fitting that we are working on this um, during uh, the month of November. Any speakers to this item? No speakers. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? So are you the liaison then to the... I, I am the, the liaison, district? yeah. Okay. And part of the updates to the board policy is updating the title. So I just happen to be the liaison because of my title, Coordinator of Student Services, and so making sure that the work that is actually being done within the district is also updated within the board policy as well. So that was a piece that was updated. Um, in addition to that, there's a number of things that the homeless liaison does do um, that wasn't previously in the current um, board policy, but because it is um, part of the requirements under the McKinney-Vento uh, Act. How many homeless kids do we currently have in our district? We have a little over 1,500 um, students that are considered homeless, and that could be for a number of various reasons. It could be that um, when it, where they go to sleep at night is not in a structure that we would think of as being a home. Um, another uh, reason why we have um, homeless youth is that they might be doubled up, tripled up, quadrupled up in you know single family dwellings. Um, we also have a number of unaccompanied youth um, that can um, be in the foster system and, and also uh, considered um, homeless as well. That's a lot. I didn't That's realize it was so many. And are you the only liaison to like the county office yeah. of ed and child welfare and all of that? Yeah, so part of my job is to make sure that I educate our sites about what the rights are of homeless youth um, and making sure that I'm, I'm there for them, but m mostly just to make sure that the sites are adhering to um, the policies that are currently in place um, at the federal level. Um, you know, it's great work, it's rewarding work. Uh, I do work with the county folks and sometimes it also means working with people outside of our county because uh, we might have students that uh, reside in Monterey County, but their their origin, their school of origin is here in PVUSD. So, um, it's it's a matter of just putting in your systems and having your meetings and you know making those connections with the people that are out there. I think it would be great if we could agendize this sometime in the future, so you could come back and tell us more about the program and what we're doing to help these kids, thank you. Well, and just so I can add to that, um, one of the updates to the board policy that would be put in place is to make sure that there are annual outcome reports to the board as well. So we would wanna make sure that we put structure to that too, so uh, the board is aware of what's going on with, uh, with our program. Yeah, that's great, thank you. I just wanna uh, make a quick comment. I think in addition to just partnering with local agencies, right, to support the students, in higher education, the homeless liaison is also involved in, in, in having that university to determine the independent status of that student. Um, so they can uh, financially uh, receive additional financial support um, and other systems of support within higher education. So I don't think your work just stays here, but I think it touches their lives even when they go off to college. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so it will be, um, I agree, I think it will be interesting to bring this back and, because I think when, when, at least for me, when I think of homelessness, it's, I think about, oh, they just don't have a home or a place to sleep. But when you think about just even just a house, housing crisis that we're experiencing here in, in this community, you do see a lot of families um, living under one house. And so I don't think they realize that that's considered homeless. And um, it could definitely, I think those families can definitely use that additional support. Um, so I think uh, I'll, be interest, I'll be interested in learning more about the type of outreach that we're doing to those families. 
Thank you. Well, you'll have to come to that meeting. I will be here. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our action items, action item 9.1, resolution 2223-24, accounting of development fees for the 21-2022 fiscal year. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So each year per government code 66001, we have to do an accounting of our developer fees and then every five years we have to do a accounting of a five-year analysis of what we've spent because um, for those of you who don't know when we do collect developer fees they have to be spent within five years so rather than doing it every five years I've actually done it every year just to keep it going so it's more of an ongoing report for the board so we'll actually be doing both for the board the resolution as well as the five-year um, explanation of our developer fees so what are our developer fees so they're cost charged to uh, both commercial and residential for new construction projects. So the, our current fees are up there. They're 581 per square foot for residential and 78 cents per square foot for commercial. These fees are very specific on what they can be used for because the intent is that this is new construction, which would potentially increase the number of students or slow the decrease of number of students in our case. Um, they can only be used for new construction, installation of portables, uh, facilities consulting. So for example, when we do our developer fee analysis, we do use our developer fees to pay for that. And then the last thing is modernization, but only when modernization allows for more space for students. So for example, if you had a portable that was no longer usable and you wanted to put money into actually repairing it to make it usable, that would be allowed because that's considered an actual addition that in increases the number of students that can be housed. So why do we do the resolution? So what the resolution effectively states is the first thing is that we have set up a separate fund to account for our developer fees. So they're outside of the general fund because once again, they can't be spent like general fund dollars. They are restricted money and they have specific uses. We do create fund 25 specifically for this use and every budget presentation we do does account for fund 25. Secondly, it does confirm that we have a public, uh, that we made our developer fee report public, which is attached to this board item so it is out there does show what we've spent the developer fees on this year and what we expect to spend them on in the future years and um, it confirms once again that we are doing a five-year analysis which is also included in this item and then lastly it shows our beginning balance our expenditures and then our balance from the prior year so it really kind of just shows an accounting of what we came in with developer fees how much we spent and how much we ended with so just to talk really quickly about the 21-22 projects, because then this is developer fees for last year. Um, some of the major projects that we did is um, we had mobile modular leases. So a lot of those are at Aptos High. We have some at um, Minty. We have some at some other our sites as well. Uh, restrooms at Ansoldo, you may remember we had that Navigator project for restrooms. Um, a lot of that actually hit in 21-22, and you might think, but Navigator was only there for a couple months. Well, as you all know, when we do construction, once it's all complete and everything's all finalized, we end up paying it out. So while the project was completed back in 2021, we actually paid for it in 21-22. So that's why it shows up in, the, in that year's developer fees. We also did part of the Duncan Holbert classrooms. You'll see that that's actually in this year as well as last year. The reasoning, again, we paid for part of the project as we were doing it, but as the project finalized, we actually paid for the remainder of it in July or August of this year. And then, um, of course, as the board noted, for those of you who were at the Starlight Kitchen, um, the board was gracious enough to use some of our developer fees to help support that project, and so we did put some developer fees towards the Legacy Kitchen as well. So as I noted, we are doing our five-year analysis as well. So this just shows back from 2718 forward an accounting of our developer fees, how, they, uh, how much we spent, how much we made in um, developer fees, interest, and then a net decrease throughout the years. So without any further items, I'd just like to ask for permission from the board to approve this resolution and answer any questions. Okay, are there any questions from the board? No, no, no questions. Can you go back to the second slide, I think? Absolutely. There we go. So those are the current fees. So you're not asking us to increase those fees this year? Not at this time. So developer fees we always do at the same time, which is um, we have it scheduled usually about in um, 
April or May, so they end up hitting in July. Because for developer fees level one, you have to wait 60 days to implement them. But yeah, at this time, we're not asking for an increase. It's just a accounting of our fees. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Looking for a motion. Make a motion to approve. One second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Item 9.2, a revised class description for senior planning specialist. Oh. Good evening, President DeSerpa. I wasn't sure if it was on. Okay. Uh, board members and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I am Pam Shanks, Director of Classified Human Resources. Um, the following item you have before you is a revised class description, which is titled Senior Planning Specialist. Um, as the board may recall, at the October 26th meeting, the board approved a new class description for an assistant director of maintenance and operations. As part of that approval, there were two vacant positions, management positions, that were eliminated. Um, one was a supervisor of maintenance and operations, and the other was the senior project manager facilities bond program. The class description you see before you tonight will replace the senior project manager position. Uh, the senior planning specialist will be a classified bargaining unit position um, and will help support the planning team with facilities needs and throughout the district. Um, this will allow for better alignment of work and the overall changes result in a cost savings to the district. Uh, the personnel commission did approve the salary placement and class description at their November 10th meeting. And this evening I asked the board to approve the new class description and the revised classified salary schedule as presented. Do we have any speakers? None. Any questions or comments from the board for Pam? No? Okay. With that, looking for a motion. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. This is item 9.3 informed K 12 automated and digital forms solution. All right, good evening again, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. My name is Pam Shanks, Director of Classified Personnel. I'm Brian Saxon. I'm the Director of, uh, <laughs> I'm the Director of HR for Certificated. Sorry, I look at your notes, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, this item we're bringing forward tonight, um, it's in an effort to continually improve our hiring practices and streamline our HR processes. Um, we have been researching various programs that would meet those needs. Um, after reviewing various programs, the HR team determined that Informed K-12 was the best program for us to invest in. Um, Informed K-12 is an education-based digital forms solution that will help us manage our forms and paperwork. All right. So in this age of competitive hiring, uh, it is important to be able to process human resource paperwork quickly and efficiently. Uh, Informed K-12 allows us to do this by helping us to manage our workflows um, in ways listed below. So we were looking at those 10 workflows there. Uh, it's gonna allow for accountability, internal reconciliation, improvement of our internal workflows, and visibly improved service to our community and personnel. So to start the project, um, we looked at the processes that were the most critical to us to move to an automated and digital, digital format to improve efficiencies and provide better customer service to our new hires, administrators, and our employees. Um, we've highlighted here on this slide um, those processes that we will work with informed K-12 on during the first phase. Um, personnel requisitions is kind of top on our list. Um, personnel action forms, new hire onboarding packets when we're hiring um, new people into the district. There's a lot of paperwork they need to fill out, so it will help us streamline that. Um, intent to return letters, reasonable assurance letters, which are done annually, um, leave requests, uh, resignation retirement notifications, stipends, and volunteer forms, just to start. As you can see, there are a lot of other processes that they do provide, but this is our, um, the first items that we're going to work with them on implementing. All right, and so uh, um, the implementation, uh, they do five forms at a time. Um, it takes uh, about six weeks or so, depending on the complexity of the form. We have 10 forms that we're going to implement, so it's going to take us about uh, 12 weeks to get everything set up and go. 
Um, there is some training involved. They test it. We work with them on the workflow, um, and then we launch it. So it's a pretty user-friendly form. They do all the work on the back end, and then we roll it out to our sites and uh, people who need to be part of this process. So we requested from Informed K-12 a proposal to address the overall needs of PVUSD on how to improve our, and be more efficient um, using their tool. And Informed K-12 provided an, a demonstration and did propose the following for us, that we start with 10 automated digital processes that they would help us implement. Um, those processes would include workflow, um, which uh, basically, the workflow is that various different approvers are part of that workflow, so it's very transparent. Um, unlimited electronic signatures and unlimited user accounts, so that will really um, help us uh, streamline a lot of our processes. All right, so this proposed agreement is on a yearly basis, automatically renews yearly thereafter. We can terminate with at least 45 days advance notice. So we recommend the board authorize us to enter into an agreement with Inform K-12 for these automated and digital forms solutions. Any speakers? None. Okay, any questions or comments from our board members? Jen Shocker. So is this replacing a current system that we're using? So we currently use a, form, a system called JotForm, mm -hmm. which is similar to this, but we have to build all the forms, we have to maintain it, it doesn't come with very good customer service or anything like that, so it will be replacing that, but that's kind of a Band-Aid approach. So this is a much more robust, uh, a JotForm is not so much educationally based, in Form K-12 is all education, it doesn't deal with private business or anything of that nature, so um, it will be replacing that, that system that we've been had for the, about the last 10 months. Okay, so the system we currently have, we've all been using for 10 months and uh, encountering problems with. Correct. Okay, and what is the um, cost comparison between this and JOT? So this, this cost for Inform K-12, the first year cost is 54,861. Uh, 18,287 of that is a implementation fee and then it's about 36,000 annually. Okay. Job form is much less. I don't know the exact cost. Um, it, it is less, but the customer service that we receive is zero. We, we have to do all of our own internal building of all of the system with JotForm, and we just don't have the, the staff to do that. So we, we've had a staff person doing that, so I would say the cost is comparable because we've spent money on that staff person to do this internally for us, and it hasn't, it's not sustainable for us. Okay, so you're not gonna have a staff person that's gonna have to be implementing these forms. They're already customized through K through 12. Yeah, Informed K-12 will build them for us. Okay. Um, and we've also um, spoke to other districts. There's a lot of districts in California that do use them, and we did some research and talked to other districts that, are very, that have been using them for a number of years and were very happy with their customer service. So um, we went with that. And last question, is this something that we're looking to, to also utilize with our timesheets and, and classifications at some point in time, or is this just going to be the functions that you had highlighted in your slide? So if you go back one slide, Silvestre, so if you look at this, like it does have the capability to do a, quite a bit, but um, we're not anticipating moving it to anywhere yet because we wanna make sure that it actually does what we want it to do. If it becomes just another like, oh, we have to do more work on our end, mm -hmm. then it won't be beneficial. But from what we've heard and researched that it, it, what happens to most districts is they look at it and they go, oh, that's really helpful. And so it starts to roll out into other areas like okay. timesheets and you know, gets into other kinds of forms that will be helpful. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Trustee Shocker, just sorry, I'm all the way over here. Just oh, to add, like, who's talking? Me. <laughs> I have a microphone. <laughs> just to add to your question about the cost, we're also reducing a position, so it'll actually be a zero cost in addition. Even though the program we have is less, we're also reducing a position in our department to accommodate the program. That's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. And what's happening to the current person in charge of creating our forms? I'm assuming she, they're not getting laid off. Human resources is not unique in having vacancies, so we actually had a person retire and we had another person leave, so we are combining the positions and we made a higher level position and also, a, and we're eliminating one. Got so, it. yeah, no, no one's being affected. 
Thank you. And and to and to piggyback onto that, the person who was our expert on this is the one who left our district, and so that's what's made it very challenging. And we really need to have um, a, com the co a company do that piece for it and build it for us, so that we don't have this issue with internal people um, with this specific work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to hear <laughs> that we're not ha we're not going to have to download the PDF forms and sign. We can e-sign now. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm talking specifically volunteer forms. I've had plenty of experience. <laughs> That's one of our yeah, first knows. projects that we've had. We've been talking <laughs> with them about. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Trustee Acosta? Yeah. Th that was actually was my question. Was I wanting to affirm that? No, no positions were being eliminated or employees in HR being affected. I take it this was a classified position that you're speaking of. And so has that been a conversation with C our CSEA leadership and folks about that that's going to be eliminated and where are they sitting with understanding that a position is being eliminated? Yes, we have conversations with them just with any restructure, like when we did payroll and benefits or the one that Pam just presented earlier. So um, we're always looking to be more efficient in the department and putting things into a more online process. And so, I mean, yes, we've had conversations. And I think part of my question on that was where are they with this? I mean, how are they sitting with this? They're fine with that? Yeah, that's why we're here, yeah. By presenting it tonight and moving forward. So they're supportive of eliminating a position, a classified position in HR. I just want that clarification. I think they're supportive of us being more efficient and with that having to eliminate a position. I get, don't know that that really answers what you think. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.4 High School Environmental Science Textbook Adoption. Hi. Good evening, Board President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Mike Russo. I am the Director of Science. And as part of our ongoing transition, to uh, new generation, next generation science standards. We have been busy uh, adopting new curriculum to replace our outdated curriculum. And most recently, our environmental studies teachers have reviewed new instructional materials. I'm here tonight to share an overview of that selection process and to make a recommendation to the board for your approval. Um, and I'll control the slides from here. And here's just a quick timeline of the process that we went through. Our discussions actually started uh, at the end of last year in May, but we formally met on our first SBC day. And this fall, the teachers have been previewing and screening four different publishers, which you'll see in a minute, and made their recommendation on October 14th. And that's what brings us here this evening. Oops. This is just an overview of the teachers involved uh, at PV High and Aptos High, which have environmental studies classes. Uh, those are the four publishers that we screened and evaluated. And at the bottom there are the two tools that we use in the selection process. And the next slides will go into those tools in more detail. Those are the four. HMH, McGraw-Hill, Savas, formerly known as Pearson and Cengage. And for all our adoptions, we use this protocol. It's the California NGSS Toolkit for Instructional Material Evaluation, and its acronym is TIME, T-I-M-E. And these are the five criteria that the teachers use the lens that they use to evaluate these publishers. And they looked at both print material and digital content for each of the publishers. And you notice the first four criteria are more NGSS aligned. So the use of phenomenon, T 
to drive inquiry base and have students problem solve. Second criteria is about using an, a logical instructional sequence, which makes perfect sense, right? We all want that. And the third one is really important is that are these uh, texts requiring students to do the heavy lifting and then do the thinking and figuring it out, right? Which is part of that science inquiry process. The fourth criteria is about the three dimensions of NGSS, those disciplinary core ideas, the content, the science and engineering practices or skills we want students to attain through the use of that curriculum, and cross-cutting concepts, right? Uh, and then the nice thing about this protocol, the time protocol, is that it allows us in criteria five there, you see that we can actually embed some of our own district specific requirements and what we call our district lens. I'll show you the next slide there. I'll talk more about the district lens. So this was put together by teacher leaders and district leaders. Uh, even before I joined the district, this is my fourth year here. And it's uh, those criteria that we feel are really important for our Pajaro student population. And so you could see, you know, besides the science and engineering practices, uh, you know, a, a focus on student talk and student discourse, the multicultural and diversity issue, uh, environmental literacy, and differentiation and scaffolding. So those are, were determined by the district and used to, as a lens for all our adoptions. And we incorporate that into our science adoptions as well. So I'm going to share with you now the results of the evaluation. I'll just go back to this slide. Those are the five criteria. They looked at all four of these publishers for each of those criteria, print and digital. And here are the scores and the results of the teacher uh, screening. So on the left side, you can see in that first column there the four different publishers. Across the top row, you can see those five criteria that we just talked about. The next to the last row, column, I'm sorry, to the right is the overall score those teachers gave each publisher. And on the far right column is their recommendation. So you can see Savas came out pretty unanimously uh, high in every each of the criteria, and the teachers strongly recommend that curriculum. And just some of the strengths, uh, one thing I want to point out there is, I'll, I'll just talk to the first and the last one, but you can read them all. Uh, I think the fact that this curriculum really empowers the students, and that's exemplified by even the title of the curriculum, and here is the, the Savas text that they are recommending to adopt and just environmental science your world your turn right and this really empowers students and with so many environmental issues and climate change can be really daunting for our young teens right to think about that challenge and this really uh, promotes them into action and how they can make a difference in the world so I think that was one strength of this and one reason why the teachers chose it. And the other, I'll just highlight right there, is that last comment by the teachers. Uh, this is exactly what they emailed me when they finished their screening of all four publishers. And just to see their excitement about what they thought about the text. And that's the whole reason why we go through this process, right? We want teachers' voices involved. We want them to make an informed decision. And we provide the structures and the format for them to do that uh, through that time protocol. So when they say we're really excited about this text, we want to get it in our students' hands as soon as possible and use it as soon as possible. Like, as a science director, I'm a happy camper. Right? That's when we can have teachers reach consensus like that and be passionate about a curriculum and they want to start using it right away, that's fantastic. And so we're thrilled and we come to the board tonight ask, and the adoption team for environmental studies recommends that the PVUSD school board approve Savas Environmental Science, Your World, Your Turn, 
as the new high school environmental studies adoption. And they're hoping, and I talked to the publisher, and it looks like we can get uh, text and digital access in their hands for the next semester. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any speakers? No. Okay. Any questions from the board? Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'll make a motion to approve this item. Oh, and I'll second. Oh, yeah, I kind of jumped the gun there, didn't I? <laughs> all those, the yeah, way. all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.5, the Pajaro Passport, purchase order with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Good evening, President de Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Jen Littleton Bruno, the Director of Expanded Learning. Extended Learning is offering PARHO Passport intercession Saturdays. In compliance with the ELOP program plan, intercession Saturdays are available to TK through sixth graders. In addition, our intercession, intercession Saturdays are opportunities for the whole family. On Saturday, December 10th, we hope to use this purchase order with the Monterey Bay Aquarium to provide a private evening and dinner to a thousand of our PVUSD participants. We look forward to offering our families this magical night and we ask that you approve this purchase order. Any speakers? No. Any questions or comments from the board? Yes, please. Yes. I just want to say thank you, Jen Littleton Bruno, for all the hard work you've done with our extended learning program and the wonderful programs that you've brought forward to the district, especially this year, with um, giving our kids opportunities that they haven't had before. And I love the fact that our families have gotten to go to Gilroy Gardens, and now they're going to get to go to Monterey Bay Aquarium, pending board approval. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to approve. Sure, I'll, I'll second. Now I just want to echo what she said. <laughs> I think it's 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 um, it's great to see um, how we are expanding access to families across the district who may not otherwise be able to afford uh, the Monterey Aquarium or um, you know anything there with free dinner and so forth. Um, I was able to attend the last Pass for event at Gilroy Gardens, and um, it was just really nice to see those smiles on kids' faces and just um, just a sense of unity and just such a great way to just keep the family together and involved. Um, so I'm in full support of this item. Thank you. Uh, um, anyone else have a comment? I just had a question. Uh, how is this going to be disseminated <laughs> among the students? So we use a multiple tier system of approaches to be able to get families to sign up. So we send out um, an email through School Messenger and Remind, being able to where families get the notice. We send out hard copies through the after school program. And then we work with Mr. Berman and his parent um, ed team where we're actually recruiting specific families that the schools are recommending to us as a form that we can pull in families that might be disengaged in their school, making them have a really creative and good experience so they're more likely to have a connection to the school day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And can you tell us more about how this will be funded? Yes, so this is part of our expanded learning opportunities program. So on, we have six Saturdays, our intercession Saturdays, and so we have decided to create a little program called the Pajaro Passport. And on these Saturdays, we need to offer nine hours of program. Across our community, every Saturday, we've offered probably 15 hours of programming. So this is in addition to the other programming. We have childcare, we have special events. And so the expanded learning opportunities program 
it's not a grant, it's actually an entitlement to the district that we are getting is paying for this. And we're specifically using carryover funds from last year. That's great. Okay. And the aquarium at night is magical. It really so is. for so many families, this will be such a treat. So thank you for setting this up. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. So we have first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you, Jen. Are you up again next? Okay. Okay. Uh, next is item 9.6, the Scholastic Order for Winter Reading Challenge. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Jen Littleton Bruno, the Director of Expanded Learning. This scholastic order will provide winter learning materials to our students. This project will utilize ACES and 21st century carryover funds that we have. This scholastic order will allow for us to purchase winter learning book sets for students in grades TK through eighth grade. The packets will include five books per student and some family literacy materials. These materials will be utilized during winter break for our expanded learning winter challenge. This is our third annual challenge that we've hosted during winter break. We are thrilled to have this opportunity to bring over 45,000 books into the homes of our students during the winter break. And we ask that you approve this. Oh, wow, that's a lot of books. Okay, any speakers? None. Any questions or comments from the board? Just think it's a great program. I'm happy to continue. We love the scholastic books. <laughs> the kids do too. I need a motion. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. And you're next also? <laughs> okay, item 9.7, Site Services Agreement, SSA, between Expanded Learning Department and Friends of the Santa Cruz County Parks. Good evening again, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm still Jen Littleton Bruno, the Director of Expanded Learning. Um, this site service agreement with Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks will support our after school enrichment programs across the district. This is an expansion of our partnership from, 20, from the 21 22 school year. This partnership is really unique. It actually brings our beautiful state parks and our beaches to our school sites. So while we were having um, COVID, when we were not able to do field trips, we found a creative way to still bring these experiences to our students. And so Friends of Santa Cruz Parks actually come to our school sites and set up little mock fire pits and students are reading and they're engaging and they're learning about the redwoods and they're learning about their whole ecosystems around them while they're at their school site. This, in addition, this will be a part of our Pajo Passport this spring, and they'll be offering four events locally on Saturdays, including soccer, fun run, and a nature festival. We look forward to this partnership, and we ask that you approve the site service agreement. Any speakers to this item? None. Any um, comments or questions? Okay. So when we, I, I do, so when okay. we talk about like a site agreement is this just with PVUSD so that all our school sites are covered? So this specific um, site service agreement for the four intercession Saturdays, it's open to all of our PVUSD students, just like the other Pajaro Passport events. And then specifically um, this program that goes on site, we'll be working with um, Alianza, Amesti, Calabasas, Freedom, Starlight, and Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. And um, this organization really chose specifically on the sites that they asked if we could focus in on because of where they are located to the parks that they yeah. really want to promote students who are living in and going to school in these regions to be able to access Pinto Lake Parks. That's a good call. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502. Thank you. 
Item 9.8, a bid award for Rolling Hills Middle School NPR finishes and bleachers. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here to present the uh, district's recommendation for award for the Rolling Hills Middle School Bleacher Project. Uh, the scope of this portion of the project is for the removal of the existing bleachers, removal of the existing uh, tile floor around the perimeter of the basketball court, installation of a new uh, vinyl composite tile floor around the court, and also uh, painting a portion of the inside of the gym. The uh, district received three sealed bids. We opened them on November 1st. The apparent low bidder is Tombleson Incorporated of Salinas, California, with the total bid of $123,875. And we ask for your approval. The uh, scheduled start for the project with your approval would be December 1st. Uh, completion of the project would happen during winter break and be ready for the students and staff to use when they return in January. Are there any speakers? None. Any comments from the board? Okay. How are you doing, Richard? So just a quick question, has all the hazmat ass assessments been done on this so that later on as they're doing demolition, they don't uncover asbestos or something else so that uh, come December, wherever in the middle of the project, you're coming back for a change order because we ran into something? Absolutely. So the, the, the first step of the process was to test the flooring that was going to be removed around the perimeter of the court um, and all that came back negative no, nothing uh, tested positive for any hazardous materials that would affect the, the project would you like to make a motion yes I'd like to make a motion to approve first time saying that <laughs> it won't be the last all those in favor aye. Aye. aye anyone opposed or abstaining great thank you rich um, Item 9.9, .9, fencing installation at Aptos Junior High and uh, Bradley Elementary. Good evening, President Serpa, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, board members, board of trustees, uh, cabinet. My name is Arlindo Fernandez, the Director of Maintenance and Operations. Um, I'm here to ask the approval for the installation of a fencing at Aptos Junior and Bradley School. Back on the fencing evaluation was presented and board approved on September 28th and this is the second round of installations that we're about to do. Um, this is to install six foot fen chain link fencing and adding additional gates to the following sites, Aptos Junior and Bradley Elementary School. For Aptos Junior, he back really came in at $37,100. And if you go back to the map, we would be adding, can you go back, please? Oh, and the, as you can see right here on the red, this is where the gates we're gonna be adding, right, right by the stairs, we're adding a gate, or by the entrance area, water tank, we're adding another one. Right at the end of the, the track and field there, we're adding another gate. The rest in yellow, it's all six foot uh, chain link fencing that we're adding. For Bradley School, Fannin fencing came in at 59,000. 800 and go back okay. and here we are in gates as you can see on the red and we're adding six foot chain link fence to the perimeter of the fencing where it's needed right now currently they have four foot fencing so it's very successful successful so, so, so somebody to cut, jump in and come in to the site so we're addressing that in this part. And that proposal came in, like I said, at 59,800. So with this, I'm asking for the board to approve the two proposals to add the additional fencing there at the sites. Do we have any speakers? None. 
Any questions from the board? I have a motion um, to approve. Oh, oh, that's okay. You can make a motion. Okay, motion a second. I have a question about access um, on the weekends and after school hours. Will the public still be able to access those sites? Because for the families go there and play on the equipment. We have soccer and baseball and lots of other things happening all weekend long and practices after school and baseball games and everything. I know for Aptus Junior, they do have keys that the, all the after, you know, like uh, the soccer. weekend activities, mm -hmm. people get and have access to the field. Mm -hmm. And right now I think we have currently walking gates, which no, if we're trying to protect the site, we're gonna put panic bars, pa panic bar hardware, so that you know people can have have it safe for the students. Can you say more about what you mean by that? I'm not sure what panic bars are. Panic bars are, you know, just yeah, <laughs> so, just so kids can easily get in and get out. So, how are kids who are walking to school gonna? get into those gates in the morning they'll be unlocked they'll be and uh, they'll be unlocked in the morning for them to get, come in so there's no public access at all to our public school sites apparently is that what we're doing is locking all of our school sites now so in general we have usage agreements and so if there's a usage agreement then we then they have access to it um, but most of our school sites that have fencing, that is how it works, that unless they've requested access, then they do not have access to our fields and they don't have access to our um, facilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the reason um, why fencing, uh, once you put in fencing, um, the panic bars are specifically so that people can easily get out, but they can't necessarily easily get in. Um, so people that have established agreements with us or that go through the facility process, they would have access, but they wouldn't have access unless um, unless it's open for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have those pilot programs in place where a couple of schools, including a home, where the city of Watsonville. Yeah. Um, yeah. And where we plan to expand upon that. I'm talk in your microphone. Yeah, it's just a very sad situation that we've come to that our public, our tax paying public who pays for these School. institutions can't access them with yeah. their kids in after hours. That's horrible. Yep. Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I reluctantly. Anyone abstaining or opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. So, well, I'll talk later. Item 9.10 ADIS Architects for HA Hyde Courtyard Ramp and Siding Replacement Project. Good evening again. Um, for this project, I will be asking for the approval for the design services for HA Hyde Courtyard and, and Site and Replacement Project, ADIS Architects of, our, of San Jose, California, has been selected by the district from the district pool. Um, the architect should be responsible for the site verification of existing conditions of the project. The architect shall provide architectural and engineer services for the design and repave several of the courtyard with ADA compliant pathways, replacing and siding of the MPR estimated architecture project management. This shall include the design towards a complete of set of biddable drawings, including elect electrical and site work. This project is estimated at 350000 Project compensation for the architect would be forty six thousand one hundred and fifty five. And I'm asking for the approval for continue with the architect so they could design 
this project. Any speakers to this item? None. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 You want opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you. You have more, don't you? 9.11, yep. Cesar Chavez Middle School Hillside Stabilization Project. Yes, good evening again. Um, and this one uh, is a Measure L fund funded project. On September 16 and 23rd, the district advertised the Cesar Chavez Middle School Hillside Stabilization Project. A mandatory bid walk was held on September 22nd, 27th, 2022. Two contractors were present. And on October 18th, the district received two bids, two sealed bids. Um, as you can see here, top tier, 122,122. Kramer Engineering, 123,212. Lowest bidder, bidder was top tier, and I'm asking for the approval for to continue with the contract for top tier with the amount of 122,122 for the Cesar Chavez Hillside project. Are there any speakers? None. Uh, any questions from the board? Just a comment. Mm -hmm. um, this, what part are this, is this gonna be at? Is this over by the track? Or, this, or is this the back area by the um, orchard? At Cesar Chavez. At Cesar Chavez. It's over uh, right above the track and right field. The, track. the hillside. Mm -hmm. We're having a little bit of erosion what, problem. Right, and that's what we had collapse and we had to fix the track, correct? Correct. Okay. We fixed part of it when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And then the other half that we didn't get became a problem. Problem. Yeah, so that's what we're fixing. Okay, so after this, hopefully um, that'll keep that from moving, sliding forward and the track will be completely usable. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. That I make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502, thank you. And finally, 9.12, our Pajaro Valley High School Learning Hub project. Good evening again. Um, for this project, it's a PV High Learning Hub project, and then this is a grant funded project. Um, on, July, on June 10th, the district advertised the PV High Learning Hub project. A mandatory bid work was held on June 14th. Three contractors were present. Sorry, two contractors were present. On July 12, the district received two sealed bids from the following contractors. Premier Builders with a price point of uh, 249192 and 101 Builders with a price point of 280821 this project was came in over budget so after talking with the contractor the lowest contractor at that point premier builder um, the district came to an agreement for premier builders to continue with the project at 168 so i'm asking for the approval for Premier Builders for 168000 to continue with this project. Any speakers? Um, can Dr. Rodriguez or Lindo, can you please tell us and the public what this is? What is this learning hub at Pajaro Valley High? No problem. So part of the money that we received for in-person learning funding was in regards to acceleration of learning. And so one of the things that we put within our, our plan for acceleration of learning was have a safe space called learning hubs. Um, these learning hubs are where we're going to have not only our migrant education tutors in there, but also our UCSC tutors that will be there after hours for students. 
And so each one of our high schools, including um, New School and Renaissance, received funding, a particular amount of funding, in order to create these learning hubs. So some of the learning hubs um, were done in the previous year. For example, Ren um, New School already has their learning hub completely done. Some schools were slower at deciding what they wanted. Um, that, that included PV High that was slower at doing that. You've already seen some of these learning hub projects coming forward. Um, PV High um, is one of the later ones to get done. Um, but we are still fulfilling our promise to the students um, and also our in-person learning grant monies um, that we would create these learning hubs. And this was, if you remember, which I know it was a while back, um, but we surveyed our parents and one of the things that was requested was to provide additional tutoring supports. And so this will be a location um, that has upgraded facilities that will um, encourage our high school students to want to attend and um, then will be um, served not only by our staff but also the staff from UCSC and the pupils tutors which are our migrant education tutors. Just one uh, clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a big drop in what we're paying, right? From 249,000 down to 168. So I'm just wondering if that is impacting the type of quality work that's going to be delivered. It, they, we, we actually removed the counter charging top area that, that was going to be installed. There was going to be a charging station. We had to remove it from the project just to get the project in the price point. So that's what we ended up doing, just. Um, so, you removed, so you removed a portion of the project. project. OK. Yeah, just the, just the scope of it. Okay. So we have, don't we have money in the technology endowment that we could use in Measure L for something like that? That's technology related. Yeah. Because um, how much I, was it? I think it's it's a it's twofold, right? So we want our sites to dream big, but we also do need them to um, be within the budget in which we provide them. Yeah. Um, construction continues to go up, yeah. so in this case, um, it was significantly more. Also, just being an educator and not a facilities person, we don't always understand how much something that seemingly doesn't seem like it would cost us a lot um, would cost us. Um, at this point, because we are at the end of our in-person learning grant funding, we do not have additional funds. Um, and to be equitable amongst the sites, I would encourage us to do the value engineered cost because that is the amount that we gave every other site. Okay. Um, and so to be equitable, I would encourage us to do that. I would love us to always be able to do to go both, um, but we do have um, budget costs that we need to adhere to. And we do not have any more in-person learning monies. We have spent it. Um, because the time period is going, and um, and so I um, I appreciate them trying to get it down to the amount in which um, we can approve. Sure, thank you. Like to make a motion to approve? I'll second. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, with regards to the change <clears throat> in the project, so when it was put out to bid. It, and you're saying you had this one item that you removed and you went back to Premier Builders who were already originally Don't the lowest know. bidder. It, I thought I heard you say the you word you negotiated this with them. Was it simply because the bid was broken down per item and you knew how much that one item was that you picked out and did it end up still being the same? Did you look back to the, the 101 builders and where they still be a higher bidder with Terry picking out that item. Correct. Is that what? Yeah. Just that would have been the, the. That's the why highest. we didn't have to go back and rebid. Yeah. Because it was just. Okay. Thank you for the clarification on that. Correct. Okay. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. 
Moving on to our consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. We'll second. Are there any speakers to this item? None. None. Okay, first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone mm -hmm. opposed or abstaining? Motion carries with uh, acknowledgement again and gratitude for the donations for our culinary kitchen and teaching garden. Thank you, everybody. Okay. <coughs> item 12. No, sorry. Item 13, action and report on closed session. Sure. So under uh, closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on November 16, 2022, with 19 and eight additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502, thank you. Under uh, closed session item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on November 16, 2022, with 26 and one additional action item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502. And under closed session item 2.4, the board voted with a 502 vote to give direction to the administration to enter into a site letter with PVFT regarding qualifications for PVFT retiree benefits. And under uh, closed session item 2.7, uh, the board uh, approved a settlement agreement between PUSD and limited term sub employee number 8693 with a 502 vote. And give me one second here. And under item 2.8, um, the board approved a final settlement for one student uh, with a 502 vote. <coughs> and that, that was, I don't know if I mentioned the item 2.8. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that conclude? Great. Um, our up, item 14.1, our upcoming board meeting will be on December 7th, and we on that meeting, we will approve our first interim report. Our meeting after that will be December 14th, and that's our annual organization meeting, and um, thank you for attending tonight, and this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>